Hi, my name is Jeff, and I'm the Technical Publications Manager on the Google Home Partner Engineering Team. I oversee all the updates to the developer documentation for our smart home programs. Hopefully you've watched the other videos and have gone through the code labs and are now ready for some general tips and tricks when working with the home APIs. If you haven't watched them yet, I recommend doing that first, then coming back here. I'll wait. Okay, now that you've done that, you're ready to continue. In this video, we won't go into depth on the things covered in the Code Lab videos, but we'll instead focus on home APIs, tips and tricks in general. Things like, where can I find the documentation? What's available on the device APIs and how do I easily test them out? What's the best way to build custom automations? Where can I get inspiration and help? All right, are you ready to begin? Let's go. The first thing you should do is get familiar with the Home API's documentation on the Google Home Developer Center. Scan the QR code to check it out. Likely, you've seen it already from doing the code labs, which are published there. From the site's homepage, go to Docs in the upper menu, then Home APIs. You'll notice that the documentation defaults to Android. It's important to remember that the Android and iOS documentation are in separate areas and do not overlap. You can easily change to iOS in the lower tab dropdown, the left navigation, or the Get Started page. It's that simple. The structure of the docs for each SDK is the same, with the full end-to-end -end process and all API guides contained solely in the Develop tab. The navigation on the left aligns with the steps in Get Started. You'll note there are a few ways to get started. You're already familiar with the code labs and sample apps from the other videos, but if you want to build your own app from scratch, start with the steps in the Start Building section. The deeper you get into development, the deeper into the API reference you might get. This is located in the Reference tab. And if you need support, go to the Support tab. But don't worry about that for now, we'll get to that later. Okay, now you know where all the docs are, so let's dive into one of the APIs, specifically the Device API. The Home API's data model is based on that of the Matter Protocol and Google Home's Cloud-to-Cloud -cloud Smart Home integrations. So the device capabilities available to you through the Device API are quite extensive. We have 90 device types and more than 120 traits. To see the full list of supported device types in the Home API section of the Developer Center, go to API Guides, Device API, Supported Device Types. For traits, these are all listed in the reference, grouped by either Google or Matter. Both Android and iOS have them grouped in a similar fashion. But I know what you're thinking. Jeff, there are too many device types and traits. Where do I start? Well, I'll tell you. A good way to get familiar with device types and their capabilities in Google Home is to create them virtually using the Google Home Playground. This was mentioned in the other videos, but I can't stress enough how useful this tool is. Let's quickly walk through how to use it, shall we? Devices created here can be accessed in the Google Home app but they can also be accessed through the Home APIs. That way, you can explore their capabilities through the Device API. First, you'll want to have a home set up in the Google Home app. Then, in the Works with Google Services tab, search for Google Home Playground. Select it and go through the account linking process. Once linked, sign into the Playground web app with the same account you used for the Google Home app. From there, click Add Device, select the desired device type, and give it a name. Once created, the device is immediately available in the Google Home app and can be controlled like any other physical device. In the Playground, edit the device traits to add more capabilities. Note that devices in the Google Home Playground are cloud-to-cloud -cloud based, so the traits you see there are not the same as those that you'll see in the Home APIs. But don't worry, traits are translated between the two data models. All you need to do is access the same home through the Home APIs and virtual devices you created in the Playground will be available. Easy. But what if you've added device types that are not covered in our samples? How do you test them out? In this situation, I recommend taking code from our sample apps and swapping out device type or trait identifiers. For example, with a light device, maybe you wanna try the level control trait instead of the on-off trait. Just switch out the trait, and from there, use the reference to find new attributes and commands for the updated trait. If you're developing an Android Studio or Xcode, Autocomplete suggests valid properties or methods contained within a device type or trait. This is super helpful and should reduce visits to the reference docs. 
And while we're on that topic, it's important to understand that not all devices of the same device type will be rendered in the Home APIs the same way. How a device appears is dependent on what features the device manufacturer implements in it. For example, from the perspective of the Home APIs, not all physical lights have the same attributes or commands. While some capabilities are required, not all manufacturers or the Google Home Playground implement the same complete set of attributes or commands for a particular device type. The key takeaway here is this. Your app shouldn't assume that all devices of the same device type support the same functionality. So prior to controlling a device, a best practice is to check through the Home APIs what functionality is supported by that device. This is done using a special set of functions, which all start with supports and exist at the trait level. For Android, there are two different supports functions, one each for attributes and commands. You specify the attribute or command as a parameter and the function returns true or false if it's supported. For iOS, each individual command has its own supports function. So check the reference documentation for the specific call you need. For attributes, use the is supported method in each trait's property wrapper. Once you know what is available for a device, you can tailor the logic of your app accordingly and gracefully handle situations when some devices have different capabilities compared to others of the same type. All right, that was a lot of information. Now let's move on to automations. The power of the Home APIs really shines with our Automation API. If you went through the Android Automations Code Lab, you know how robust the API is, but also how daunting it can be to create an automation. So here are a few tips that should make it easier for you. Personally, when I am trying to understand a complicated topic, I like to diagram it out on a piece of paper. That's right, using pen and paper. Before trying to code any automation, write out the logic of what you want the automation to do. Use blocks for each node in the automation. In other words, what is the logic at each point in the flow, a node, and what devices are part of that node? Next, I recommend implementing some kind of automation, not using the Home APIs, but using one of our other automation surfaces, the Google Home app or the script editor in Google Home for Web. In the Google Home app, you can use a graphical interface to create automations. With the script editor in Google Home for Web, you can script your automation in a YAML format using many of the same capabilities found in the Home APIs. The script editor is available at home.google.com. And while the script editor syntax is very different from that of the Home APIs, it is straightforward to use, the results can be seen immediately without having to build and deploy an app, and successfully creating something there will make your Home APIs journey that much easier. Because you will already understand the basic logic of how automations in Google Home work. So starting with the basic automation you diagrammed out on paper, create it in one of those apps, trigger it, and see how the devices in your home react. Did they do what you expected them to? If not, revise it and try it again. Now, before we go any further, there's one important thing to remember. For safety and security reasons, not all device capabilities are available for use in an automation. For example, you cannot create an automation that starts an oven or unlocks a door. So depending on the combination of device type and action, some actions are blocked for use in a Home API's automation. For a full list, scan the QR code to view the blocked actions page. But just because it's not on the blocked actions page doesn't mean it's available for use. Not every attribute or command is useful in an automation. So also check the trait support page to ensure your desired action is available. Scan the QR code to find out. If you're using the Discovery API as covered in the previous video, these restrictions should all be taken care of for you. We've done all the heavy lifting so you don't have to. In some cases though, you can still perform an action not available for direct use in an automation. For example, if you are able to control a device using voice, you can probably trigger it in an automation by using the OK Google command of the Assistant Fulfillment trait. Oops, sorry if I just activated your Google devices by saying that but this command allows you to send a natural language query to the APIs, which is equivalent to speaking to Google Assistant. Let's say you want your speakers to play the sound of rain when you turn on a certain light. In this automation, you could use the OK Google command to send a query of play rain sound to any Nest hubs you have in response to a light being turned on. So as you can imagine, this functionality opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for automations in the home APIs. Play around with it and see what you can do. 
And finally, if you need more inspiration, we have a catalog of automation examples on the Developer Center. Use them as starting points for your own automation if you like. This catalog is available on the Example Automations page. Scan the QR codes to view the Android and iOS versions. Now you should have a better understanding of the device and automation APIs and how to experiment with them. I just want to highlight a few more things before we wrap up this video. If you're looking for Home APIs inspiration, check out our Case Studies Hub on the Developer Center. It's accessible through resources in the upper menu under the Business Resources column. Here you can read how other developers have used the Home APIs in their production apps and the innovative use cases the APIs help solve for them. And finally, sometimes you need a little help. And given how new the Home APIs are, you may be one of the first encountering an issue or are struggling to find the information you need online. For that, we have a few avenues of support. There's a support tab in both the Android and iOS sections of the Home APIs documentation. The primary avenue for help is the Smart Home Developer Forum. We suggest that you try that first for any questions or suggestions. The Google Home team actively monitors this forum and can help developers get the answers they seek. Another option is Stack Overflow, where other Home APIs developers may have already encountered the same problems or can offer advice. Lastly, if you encounter bugs when working with the Home APIs, such as things the Google Home team needs to investigate, file a bug in our issue tracker. Make sure to include in your bug all the information listed on the support page. And that's it. Hopefully, the topics I covered here are helpful to you on your Home APIs development journey. I can't wait to see what you build.